I first met Barbara Jordan when I was a young attorney and had been given a position working for the House of Representatives Judiciary Committee investigating Richard Nixon. <laughs> and it was such a profound moment in American history. And there wasn't anyone who was a more effective, eloquent inquisitor than Barbara Jordan. As a 26-year-old, fresh out of law school, as some of you are perhaps now, having graduated from the Thurgood Marshall School here at TSU, I was riveted and, and not a little intimidated, to tell you the truth, by this unstoppable congresswoman from Texas. I got to talk with her, which was thrilling. I got to hand her papers, which was equally exciting. But mostly, I got to watch and listen to her. At a time of shaken confidence, she stirred the entire nation with her words. Remember what she said. My faith in the Constitution is whole, it is complete, it is total. It was that passion and moral clarity that took Barbara Jordan from TSU and the halls of the Texas legislature all the way to Congress. The first woman, the first African American ever elected to represent Texas in the House of Representatives. And she defended and continued the civil rights legacy of Dr. Martin Luther King, Jr., and her friend and mentor, President Lyndon Johnson. And in particular, she was a staunch advocate for the Voting Rights Act, which had helped make it possible for her to be elected. In 1975, in the face of fierce opposition, Barbara Jordan led the fight to extend the special protections of the Voting Rights Act to many more Americans, including Hispanic Americans, Native Americans, and Asian Americans as well. And like every woman who has run for national office in this country in the last four decades, I stand here on the shoulders of Barbara Jordan, and so does our entire country. And boy, do we miss her. We miss her courage. We also miss her humor. She was funny. I remember talking to her and Ann Richards one time, and between the two of them, Forget trying to get a word in at all. And they were telling me about how they love to go to the University of Texas women basketball games, right? And Barbara would be there by that time in her wheelchair on the sidelines, and Ann would be holding court right next to her. And Barbara would be yelling directions like she was, you know, the coach. Why are you doing that? Jump higher. That's not a pass, you know, all of those kinds of sideline comments. And so Ann was telling me this with, with Barbara right there, and Ann said, well, you know, I finally turned to her and I said, Barbara, encourage these young women. Don't just criticize them. And Barbara turned around and she said, when they deserve it, I will. <laughs> We sure could use her irresistible voice. I wish we could hear that voice one more time, hear her express the outrage we feel about the fact that 40 years after Barbara Jordan fought to extend the Voting Rights Act, its heart has been ripped out. And I wish we could hear her speak up 
for the student who has to wait hours for his or her right to vote, for the grandmother who's turned away from the polls because her driver's license expired, for the father who's done his time and paid his debt to society but still hasn't gotten his rights back. Now we know, unfortunately, Barbara isn't here to speak up for them and so many others, but we are. And we have a responsibility to say clearly and directly what's really going on in our country. Because what is happening is a sweeping effort to disempower and disenfranchise people of color, poor people, and young people from one end of our country to the other. Because since the Supreme Court eviscerated a key provision of the Voting Rights Act in 2013, many of the states that previously faced special scrutiny because of a history of racial discrimination have proposed and passed new laws that make it harder than ever to vote. North Carolina passed a bill that went after pretty much anything that makes voting more convenient or more accessible. Early voting, same-day registration, the ability of county election officials to even extend voting hours to accommodate long lines. Now, what possible reason could there be to end pre-registration for 16 and 17-year-olds and eliminate voter outreach in high schools? We should be doing everything we can to get our young people more engaged in democracy, not less. In fact, I'd say it is a cruel irony, but no coincidence, that millennials, the most diverse, tolerant, and inclusive generation in American history, are now facing so much exclusion. And we need look no further than right here in Texas. You all know this far better than I, but if you want to vote in this state, you can use a concealed weapon permit as a valid form of identification, but a valid student ID isn't good enough. Now, Crystal Watson found out the hard way. She grew up in Louisiana, but came to Marshall, Texas to attend Wiley College. And Crystal takes her responsibilities as a citizen so seriously that not only did she register to vote in Texas where she was living and would be for a number of years, she even became a deputy registrar to help other people vote as well. But this past year, when she showed up at her local polling place with a Wiley College ID, she was turned away. Experts estimate that hundreds of thousands of registered voters in Texas may well face similar situations. And while high-profile state laws like those in Texas and North Carolina get most of the attention, many of the worst offenses against the right to vote actually happen below the radar like when authorities shift poll locations and election dates, or scrap language assistance for non-English speaking citizens, something Barbara Jordan fought so hard to provide. Without the pre-clearance provisions of the Voting Rights Act, no one outside the local community is likely ever to hear about these abuses let alone have a chance to challenge them and end them. Now,
it's not a surprise for you to hear that studies and everyday experiences confirm that minority voters are more likely than white voters to wait in long lines at polling places. They are also far more likely to vote in polling places with insufficient numbers of voting machines. In South Carolina, for example, there's supposed to be one machine for every 250 voters, but in minority areas, that rule is just often overlooked. In Richland County, nearly 90% of the precincts failed to meet the standard required by law in 2012. Instead of 250 voters per machine in one precinct, it was more than 430 voters per machine. So not surprisingly, people trying to cast a ballot there faced massive delays. Now, there are many fair-minded, well-intentioned election officials and state legislators all over our country. But this kind of disparity that I just mentioned does not happen by accident. Now, some of you may have heard me or my husband say one of our favorite sayings from Arkansas. Of course, I learned it from him. If you find a turtle on a fence post, it did not get there on its own. <laughs> well, all of these problems with voting just didn't happen by accident. And it is just wrong. It's wrong to try to prevent, undermine, inhibit Americans' rights to vote. It's counter to the values we share, and in a time when so many Americans have lost trust in our political system, it's the opposite of what we should be doing in our country. This is the greatest, longest-lasting democracy in the history of the world. We should be clearing the way for more people to vote, not putting up every roadblock anyone can imagine. Yet, unfortunately, today, there are people who offer themselves to be leaders whose actions have undercut this fundamental American principle. Here in Texas, former Governor Rick Perry signed a law that a federal court said was actually written with the purpose of discriminating against minority voters. He applauded when the Voting Rights Act was gutted and said the lost protections were outdated and unnecessary. But Governor Perry is hardly alone in his crusade against voting rights. In Wisconsin, Governor Scott Walker cut back early voting and signed legislation that would make it harder for college students to vote. In New Jersey, Governor Chris Christie vetoed legislation to extend early voting, and in Florida, when Jeb Bush was governor, state authorities conducted a deeply flawed purge of voters before the presidential election in 2000. <laughs> Thankfully, in 2004, a plan to purge even more voters was headed off. So, today Republicans are systematically and deliberately trying to stop millions of American citizens from voting. What part of democracy are they afraid of? I believe every citizen has the right to vote, and I believe we should do everything we can to make it easier for every citizen to vote. <laughs> 